It's July 1988. Berkeley Softworks unleashes the second version of its graphic environment operating system for the Commodore 64. This amazing piece of software gives us, out of the box, a what you see is what you get desktop environment, a paint program, a word processor with spell checking, and desktop accessories like a calculator notepad. And somehow, this ran on an 8-bit processor running at 1 megahertz with 64K of RAM and the world's slowest 5 quarter inch disk drive. In this video, we're going to take a journey through GIOS through the years. And we're going to start out with this very simple one drive, one mouse, one printer Commodore 64 setup. Get GIOS 2 up and running, use it a little bit, and evolve our hardware over time. We're going to go from our minimum requirement system all the way up to the C64 with a hard disk and Jiffy DOS, and possibly even up to wheels. A version of GIOS that came out 10 years after this version. We are going to explore GIOS for what it was like to use as a regular user. So the machine that I have set up in Vice is a C64C in NTSC, because I grew up in North America, a 1541 disk drive, 1351 mouse in port 1, and a Commodore MPS801 printer. I'm going to keep the load times unedited so we can experience together just how slow it was originally. But more importantly, as we add more hardware and upgrade our system, we can see the impact of that performance. So let's get started. So out of the box, it comes on three disks that are double-sided. The two that we're going to start with is a system and the system backup disk. This software is very heavily copy protected. The first time you load this, the disks will brand themselves with a unique fingerprint. So let's put disk 1A in, the system disk, and load star come A comma 1. So the very, very first time you load GIOS on a system disk, it's going to go through a process where it creates some kind of random fingerprint and applies it to the system disk and the backup system disk. And as far as I can tell, the whole purpose of having two system disks is in case you trash one, at least you have the other to go to. So as you can see here, it's, the first thing it's asking us for is the backup disk. And it's going to flip back and forth between these two disks a few times to fingerprint it. So we're going to put in our backup system disk here. I press the enter key because we don't have a mouse yet, so we have to use the cursor keys. Um, if you've never owned GS before, which we haven't, we're going to choose no. Now it wants the system disk again. Wants the backup system again. And it wants the system again. So while this is loading, I actually never had GIOS uh, as a kid. So I've only read about it and seen you know, lots of articles and, and uh, people kind of talking about it throughout the years, but I've never actually uh, experienced this firsthand. So this is gonna be very interesting. So of course, uh, before this video, I've been playing around with it for a few days to kind of get the hang of it. And I think I've got a pretty good grasp of it. So here is the desktop in all of its glory. But as you'll notice, mouse doesn't work yet. So the very first thing we need to do is configure the input device to use a mouse. So what you do is you press Commodore I. And then we're going to use the cursor keys to choose 1351A and we press enter. That's like the mouse button. Now there's also one for 1351. I have no idea what the difference is. I've tried them both and they both seem to work the same. But since this one's higher in the list, I figure it's the one they want us to use. So we're going to choose that 1351A. I'm going to tap OK. And it's going to load our mouse driver. And now we have mouse. So to toggle the mouse on and off when you're in device, you press Alt-M, and that captures the mouse so you can use it. So on the top here, you'll notice we have a clock. And the date is July 6, 1988. That's the day that GS2 was released. Kind of an interesting uh, default date. So we're going to click on it and this will let it and this will let us change it to today's date, October 5th, 23, and it's uh, at this point it's 7:30 p.m. Now there's no battery backed clock in the Commodore 64. So when you reboot the machine, that time will get reset. But don't worry, 
we will be introducing battery backed clock feature later, much, much, much later. But it is a thing that we do eventually get to. But in our default configuration, there's no battery backed clock. Another interesting thing about the clock is it says 23, but that's not 2023. This was uh, pretty far before Y2K. So that date is 1923. So what we're looking at right now is desktop 2.0. This icon is the program that's running and that's what you're seeing here. What we're seeing up here is the name of the disk, which is the system disk. And then below it is our icons that represent files on that disk. So you're gonna see a mix of file types here. There's 47 files on a system disk. And to get to the second page of files, I can click this little tear up here to go to the second page. And then I can click this one down here to go back to the first page. We can also press the number keys to jump right to a certain page. So we can go to page two and we're gonna look at the preference manager. This type of icon or program is called a desktop accessory. And it's three that you can see here, the preference manager, the pad color manager, and the alarm clock. They, they run very similar to Windows programs or Mac programs where you double click it and they run. But if they are desktop accessories, they also appear in this GS menu um, as the, oops, they also appear in this GS menu as these bottom three options. So let's run the preference manager. So the preference manager is gonna let us change some basic system colors and it's another place to set the date and time. So for me personally, I like the mouse to be white. This is what I'm used to. And I'm gonna make the border um, kind of a gray to kind of match the foreground a little bit. There we go. So we're gonna hit the change button to see what it looks like. And then we're gonna save it. And we're gonna exit. So the next thing we wanna do is configure our printer because right now it just says Commodore compatible printer, but we have a Commodore MPS 801 printer. So to change your printer, we're gonna to go to GIOS. We're gonna do select printer. And it's gonna present us a list of all the different printers or print drivers rather that come on a system. And we're just gonna kind of scroll down here until we see our MPS 801 printer. There it is. And we're gonna choose okay. So two things are gonna happen here. The icon at the bottom, which has already happened, shows you an MPS 801. That's the current type of printer we're using. And then on the, uh, the notepad here, we're gonna see the same thing. This print driver that said COM compatible before now says MPS 801. So when you change your printer, they, they kind of do you a solid by putting the icon on the first page. Because if you go back towards like page six, I think, you're just gonna see pages and pages of print drivers. So luckily you don't have to go chasing it down every time you need it. More on that in a moment. So one thing you may have noticed is there's all these different types of icons and it's kind of hard to tell what's what. Uh, if you do view and we do it by type, it'll list instead of icons, all the files on a disk with a type by name, which at first is really neat. So I can see that there's input drivers, there's system boot files, there's an auto exec, there's all these different types of files on a disk. The one downside to this view is you can't actually click or use any of the icons. In fact, you can't do that in any of the views, only the icon view. It kind of limits the usefulness of this feature. So we're gonna go back to icon view. So a solution to kind of help let us figure out what is what is to use the other desktop accessory, the pad color manager. So we're gonna fire this up. This lets us customize the icons in the notepad area with different colors so we can have a better clue as to what we're looking at. So you can see all these different types of files. You can choose a color, and of course you can choose a color for the background and a foreground of the notepad itself. They give you three pretty good default ones to pick from. I think I kind of like this one. So we're gonna save this.
and we're gonna exit. And then the uh, the file pad is gonna have all these different colored icons, which will make it easier to look at. And I also like this new color of the, the notepad. I think it's easier for me to read. So with that out of the way, we've now dealt with a system disk. We've configured the print driver, we've configured our mouse, and we've changed some colors, and we set the time. So the way GIOS approaches applications is you create what's called a work disk. And on this work disk, you're gonna put the applications, fonts, print drivers, just all the bits and pieces that you need to do the project that you wanna work on. So we're gonna create a work disk so we can do some word processing. So in Vice, we're gonna create a blank diskette and attach it to eight. But before we do that, we wanna close this diskette. You press this button to let GS know that we're done with this disk. So now let's create and attach an empty disk image and we're gonna call it a work disk. Uh, work disk and I'll just put that and we'll hit save and now that it's attached Then we should be able to click here and see our blank disk the First thing it's going to tell us is hey, this is a non geo diskette. Would you like to convert it? And we're going to choose yes So a blank 1541 disk gives us 165 kilobytes you'll notice also down here that it says the MPS 801 is not on disk. When I say you gotta put everything on a work disk, you gotta put everything on a work disk. You gotta put a copy of the desktop on it. You gotta put a copy of the print drivers on it. So we're gonna close this disk and we're gonna switch back to our system disk. And now we need to copy desktop and a print driver over to that disk. So how do you do that? So what you do is you, you click an icon now unlike windows or mac you don't have to drag it by holding it down you just click it and now it's selected and then if i click it again i get a little ghost icon and i'm not holding the mouse button down i'm just moving it over here and i'm going to click it over here and that's going to put it into this little border area so we're going to put the desktop down here and we're going to put our printer driver down here okay and then we're going to close this disk and then we're going to reattach our work disk. We're going to click our work disk. Now our blank disk opens and we still have these icons down here. We're going to click this and then click it again and then drag it up here. Now, as you can imagine with one disk drive, we're going to be switching back and forth between these disks quite a bit. So we go to system. It's going to read a bunch of the file into memory. It's going to ask us for the work disk again, where it's going to write it back out. So we put our work disk back in, press OK. Now the desktop app is about 35K. So it's actually a pretty big app. So it may take us two passes to copy it. Let's see. Yep, so we'll go back to the system disk. Let it read more of it into memory. Then back to our work disk again. Well, I'm glad I'm not in a hurry tonight. All right, just writing away. All right, we got the big application out of the way. The print driver luckily is way smaller, so we do the same thing again with the printer. Go back to the system disk. Luckily this file is pretty small, so it goes a bit quicker. Go back to our work disk. Oops, gotta press OK twice sometimes. Sometimes a little bit faster than Vice is ready for. All right, so now we've got the desktop and we've got a print driver. And notice now that the print driver is now recognized. It no longer says not on disk. So we're gonna close this. We're actually gonna go back to the system disk for a moment. Because it's a small kind of a pet peeve I have with GIOS so far. So we put those icons in a border area and it leaves them there. And it remembers it between reboots. 
So you have to come back to the original disc. You're kind of like sort of light OCD like me. I need to make sure I put everything back where it belongs when I'm done. You don't have to do this. It's just a thing that I need to do. So we're going to close this disc and we're going to go to our applications disc. So this is the second side of the second diskette. And on here are some applications that we can put on our work disk. So when you buy Geos, it comes with GeoWrite and GeoPaint. These are the two big apps. And you'll notice that this disk doesn't have a whole lot of uh, free space here. So if we tap on GeoWrite, just to get an idea of how big it is, we can go to File and we can go to Info. I believe it's 30 something K. Yeah, 35 K. So it's, it's pretty big. So we're going to want to take this and put it down here because we want to copy this to our work disk as well. And on this disk is some other cool stuff. So if I go to the second page, they have three desktop accessories. We're going to grab the calculator. I'm going to tap it, tap it again, drag it down here. And then we're going to go to the third page and we're going to grab this font. So this way we have a, we have a font, we have a desktop accessory, and we have a word processor. So now we got to close this. We're going to put our work disk back in and we're going to start the tedious process of copying it. I'm going to do the small files first. Oops, got to tap the disk here to get it onto the desktop. All right, so we're going to take our calculator and we're going to plop it here. Of course, we have to go back to the applications disk to do that. And go back to the work disk. Oop, I clicked it too fast. All right, we're going to bring our font up. And the same thing is going to happen. We have to go to the application disk. And again, this is a pretty small program, so this one will go pretty quick as well. All right, and then we need to do our word processor. This is the one that's going to take uh, probably a couple passes. So we'll throw our application disk in and we'll let it start. Now you might be wondering to yourself, why don't I just multi-click three of the files and drag them up in one uh, one copy? You can't do that with a single disk drive. Uh, GS will give you an error that you can't select more than one um, file with a single disk drive setup. So you have to do them one at a time like we're doing now. And then once this is done copying, we're going to jump into GeoWrite and take a quick tour of using GeoWrite. All right, we're going to jump back to the applications disk so it can read hopefully uh, the last bit. Oops, press enter again. All right, back to our work disk. I think we're in home stretch here. All right, we now have a work disk. I think the last thing I would like to do is rename it. So I think I want to rename this work disk. So we can go to the disk menu and we can go to rename. A mixed case name work disk. Now, a couple interesting things you can do here. You can take these icons and move them to very specific spots on the notepad if you like. You also have the option of creating a page. So, right now we have one page, but if you go to page and we go to append, 
we'll get a second page. And then to move icons to the second page, oops, let's go back to the first page here. We can copy them to the border area again. Now this time, because we're not copying between disks, we should be able to do this in one shot. So if I click to, and you'll notice it has the word multi-file as the icon. And I'll click them down here. So they both come down to the side area. Uh, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll, we'll put this over here. Oh, you know, we'll put the, oops, I guess I didn't like that. <laughs> so we'll go to the second page. And then using a the Commodore key, I'm clicking on both. And then I can drag these both back up. All right. Let's give GeoRide a shot. So now we're actually going to create a document with our with our application GeoRide. GeoRide takes about I think it's like 12 or 13 seconds to open. All things considered, not too bad. So we're presented with some options: create a new document, open an existing one, quit the desktop. Of course, we're going to create a new document because we don't have one yet. And let's call this um, I don't know. Hello World seems like an appropriate name. Press Enter. I guess it's getting everything ready here. Probably checking for fonts. And here we are in our word processor. All right, so let's call this uh, Section 1 Introduction to Geos. And we'll come down here. And I'm going to say uh, this document is going to cover the basics of how to use the Geos. Oops, Geos operating system on the Commodore 64 home computer. As you can tell, I'm not really aiming for uh, good grammar or spelling here. <laughs> this is not the fastest desktop GUI in the world, but it is very impressive anyway. And I'm gonna leave those spelling mistakes in. So you'll notice a couple things as I was typing. We can only see about half or maybe two thirds of the page at a time. And you'll notice that the text kind of runs off to the right. As we're typing, the, sh the screen was shifting to like the right side and the left side of the page. There's a little visual representation up here of what part of the document we're looking at. Now, if I take the mouse luckily and just kind of bounce it to the edge, it bounces me to the right side. So do it going down and I can do it going up. And if I had a lot of stuff on the page, I can click this and then I can move it anywhere in the page I want and it'll change the view to that portion. There's nothing there, so it's not gonna do it. There we go, let's kinda of get up back to our starting point here. There we go. So there's a couple things we can do here, right? We can highlight text with the mouse. We can change the style. We can make it bold. So now we have a nice little bold section title. And because of the way that we typed in our text, we can do some interesting formatting. So if you click into here, and when I say click, let me just, you know, down and up, not dragging everything, we get a little P, and this is kind of our paragraph indent. So I can drop that here, and of course the paragraph now has an indent, and it starts here automatically. I have a little M here that if I tap on, same thing, I get a little margin, so I can kind of set the left paragraph margin, and just make the paragraph start a little bit in. And as you can imagine, there's one on the right side of the page as well. It also supports tab stops. You can do a thing like if I want to create um, a list of prices of stuff, right? I can just tap here in this little area here. So I'll tap one here and I'll get a tab stop. And then I can create another tab stop over here. And I can make this a, um, I think they call it a decimal tab stop. And you click it again and then you press the space bar and you click it again. And now it's a, a black tab stop. So what does that mean? Well, I can press control I now to get to the first tab stop. And I might put something like, um, ooh, I don't know, cost of coffee. And I can press control I. Ooh, probably didn't get enough space here. Let's make this a little further out. So I'm gonna tap, clack. So I'm gonna click on this and we're gonna 
drop it over here. All right. Now we're going to press Control I, and you'll notice that the cursor moves to the tab stop, and I can type in I don't know one hundred and fifty dollars and eighty nine cents, and then I can press Control I to to bring us here, and I may say that this is um, uh, the cost of milk. Control I. Uh, and these are just obviously nonsensical numbers, but you can see it's kind of neat. You can kind of build like a, a sort of, uh, you can build a formatted table of things. Cost of gas, control I, $35. And you can probably, there's probably a better way to do it, but I'm going to use dashes to kind of represent a table. And I'll use a dot here just so I can get, oops, so I can get it over there. total and I'm going to test my math skills. I'm going to just round it up <laughs> to like 300, um, 300 dollars. Clearly that math does not work out, but you can make a pretty nice looking document. If I wanted to end this page and start a new page, I can go to the page menu and I can enter what's called a page break. And eventually the second page will appear. <laughs> there it is. And then we could write something you know, a little bit more basic, like, uh, hello there, this is page two. And you can uh, go to page and you can go back. A lot of the keys do have uh, shortcuts to it. So I can use control minus and plus, for example, to jump between the pages. So going back to page one is a bit of a journey here. Excellent, we're back on page one. Uh, of course, it supports copying and pasting. So I can copy this whole section here. You can go to edit, you can go to copy. Control C or Commodore C is pretty close to what we have in a modern day. All right, and then I can go to the next page. And then of course I can paste it. So we'll come to the end here, press enter. Oops, I got a little extra character there. And then we can go to edit, then we can go to paste. And we'll paste the text. So there's copy and paste in action. And there's actually a little bit more to that, but we'll get to that in a moment. Let's drop back to page one. So if you remember, we copied over a desktop accessory or calculator, and I did mention how I didn't really want to do the math at the time, uh, but now we've got a desktop tool that can do it for us. So we can go to GIOS and we can use calculator and this calculator will pop up over our app. So it's kind of feels like multitasking. It really isn't, but it is still kind of neat. Takes a few minutes to get going. There we go. Now you can't move the window, so you just gotta be really careful that you don't open it on top of the numbers you're trying to add. But I should be able to type in 150.89 plus 25.67 plus 35 equals, and I get my 211.56. So I can close. Oh, I wonder if this goes to the clipboard. Uh, probably not. But if I press Commodore C, we're gonna explore this together. And then we close this. Then we come down here with our cursor, and then we say paste. Do we get the answer? Uh, text. Let's see what we get. We do, fantastic. So it's actually a really neat tool. So the desktop accessories are kind of like multitasking uh, within GS, and you can bring up a whole bunch of things to, to do some work for us. So I'm gonna highlight this text again. And once again, I'm gonna do edit, copy. I'm gonna leave it there. And now let's exit GeoWrite. What's gonna happen is that text that we put in a clipboard is gonna be put into what's called a text scrap file. And you're gonna see it on our desk pad when it comes up here. And that is how we can transfer text between applications and documents. And there's the text scrap. So in here, it keeps the very last thing that you put in a clipboard that is text. And we can use that text in any other application. 
So as you can see, once we get the work disk going, it's not too bad, but building a work disk is definitely um, a lot of work of the right hand of changing disks in and out of the disk drive. So we should probably work on getting a second disk drive in our system to help speed things up. So let's close this out and let's shut down the machine and let's get another drive. Well, now we have a 1581 disk drive attached as drive nine on our system. Uh, the 1581 disk drive takes three and a half inch double sided double density disks. This means that the drive will read from both sides of the disk, uh, I guess at the same time, uh, which means you can't flip the disk over to store more on the other side. The bonus is you don't have to flip disks. You have, you know, all that capacity uh, in one go, which is really convenient. We also get just a ton more disk space. With our blank disk, we should have about four and a half to five times as much empty space. All right, while this is booting up, let's create and attach blank 1581 disk attached to drive nine. So we're gonna go into this create and attach an empty disk menu. We're gonna call this uh, big work. Put big work here. We're gonna make sure we choose drive nine and make sure we change the drive type to D81. So now if I tap on drive B here, it's gonna ask me if we wanna convert this to GI. So we're gonna choose yes. And here we go, 790K free. That is a ton of room. Let's rename this disk to something slightly more uh, friendly, less yelly. So we're gonna call this big work. All right, let's drop back to the system disk. And we're gonna copy two files to our new 1581 disk. We're gonna copy desktop and configure. If I hold the Commodore key down, I can highlight both files. I'm gonna click, and I'm not dragging, just clicking. And then I move this over on top of big work, and I'll hit click. So file copying is much easier in a two drive system. I don't have to copy the files down into the border area, flip the disk, bring them back up, and just kind of switch back and forth. It's way more efficient this way but you must put configure and desktop on all of your work disks. So what happens if we don't put configure on the 1581 disk? If you launch an application for the 1581 disk and you quit it, when you come back to the desktop, it won't see the 1541 disk drive. And the opposite is true too. If I launch, for example, GeoWrite off of the 1541 disk drive and configure was not on it, when I exit out, the 1581 would disappear and you wouldn't be able to see it. So this can get a little annoying, especially as you're you know, jumping to another disk. Like let's say you wanted to run the spell checker from one disk. You have to put a copy configure on it. But we'll get into how to solve those problems shortly. So now we're gonna switch our drive eight to our old work disk. Okay, I wanna click back on here. And let's just copy the document over to the 1581. So we're gonna cl click this and then drop it over here. And again, it's so much easier to copy files this way. So much more intuitive. Let's say we wanted to save time and not copy GeoWrite to big work. We just wanna launch GeoWrite from our work disk here and open the document on your other disk. So let's launch GA right here and see if we can do that. So now we have GA right up and we're gonna get our dialog box to open a document, create a document or quit. So I wanna open an existing one. So right now it's showing me the contents of the work disk, but you'll notice there's no way for me to choose the other disk drive where we have our other documents. So even though we have a two drive system, applications in its current configuration cannot open documents on another disk. So that seems like quite a bit of a limitation, but because our work disks can now be so much larger than 1581 disks, 
it's really not too bad. We could just copy everything over to it and it'll be okay. So at this point, we've already improved the environment significantly. So even though we have a two drive system, the application will still only recognize the current drive when you use them. So the idea of the work disk is really enforced with this. You need to put everything you want on that 1581 disk. So if I wanted to have a paint program as a part of that project, uh, GeoWrite as a part of that project and a spell checker. I got to put it all on the 1581 drive in order to use those, all those applications together to work on that project. We will be making an enhancement that will let us open files on different drives though. So at this point, we've already improved the environment significantly with the added 1581 disk drive. This upgrade has eliminated a ton of disk swapping. We also now have the ability to use more applications, fonts, and graphics in a single project by having the 1581 work disk that's almost five times as large as the 1541 does contain all of that stuff that we need. We also get quite a bit of a performance boost. The 1581 drive is about 20 to 40% faster than the 1541, depending on what you're doing. So in the next video, we're going to add a RAM expansion and a hard disk to our configuration and explore how those two devices will massively upgrade the experience as well as look at some more GS applications. Well, you are a true fan of the retro experience if you're able to watch this entire video without skipping once over the disk load times, and I truly commend you. I kept those load times in to ensure that you can see what the real experience of using GIOS with this kind of configuration was. But I do look forward to seeing what a huge change the RAM expansion has on a system by itself. And then when we add the hard drive, it just gets way, way better. Uh, so again, thank you so much for watching this video. And I hope to see you around in a follow-up video. Take care.